Well, thank you very much for the uh, wonderful introduction. Um, as I said, I'm Chase Stevens. Um, I do want to take a moment before I really start my talk, uh, stop my talk in earnest, rather, to uh, just acknowledge what an honor and a privilege it is to be here, uh, getting to listen to a speaker such as myself, a real uh, master of uh, the craft. So you should all feel very lucky. Um, <laughs> I do want to uh, just make a, a small uh, shout out to my uh, company, Take a Metrics. It's a Boston-based company. Um, we build a machine learning platform that helps online sellers uh, optimize for profitability across their entire business. We use really interesting tools, so TensorFlow, Jupyter Notebooks, Hypothesis for testing. Um, it's a really cool place to work. Um, we have. Uh, you know, currently, I think three billion dollars of retail revenue that we manage uh, per year, and that's across thousands of sellers that include some of like the hottest, hottest brands. Um, so, absolutely, if you are uh, looking for a new place to work and looking for a place where you can have a, uh, a real challenge, uh, but also get to work with cool people, uh, then drop me a line. All right. Uh, I also want to say that uh, this entire talk is up on GitHub, uh, so if you'd like, after the talk, uh, you can go and check all this out. There's a Docker image you can build that'll allow you to run this, uh, so hopefully you'll find that very useful. Right, so the premise of the talk here, basically, is that, uh, first of all, I'm not going to be showing you, I promise, anything more uh, complex or difficult than um, parsing JSON or um, manipulating the DOM tree or generating XML, right? It's really basic stuff. People get very, I don't know, flustered about ASTs, I find, uh, but it's, it's simple. Um, I'm gonna be showing you a lot of tools that are out there already on PyP, pip installable, uh, that will allow you to leverage the AST to do static manipulation uh, and uh, runtime manipulation of code, uh, which is obviously very cool. Uh, and I'm also uh, hopefully going to be not giving you uh, enough information that you can just stand up and uh, start hacking on AST stuff, but enough to get started, like right? places to look for, uh, resources to go to. Um, and really all I'm asking in return is to be uh, revered as a modern day Prometheus. Um, just someone who's coming down from Olympus and bringing the knowledge to all your ignoramuses uh, about uh, what the AST can do. So it's a very simple quid pro quo. I, I hope we can all agree to this. Um, so let's start off, what is an AST? Um, the uh, AST stands for Abstract Syntax Tree, uh, but that can be a little bit of a misnomer, I find. Really what you want to think about conceptually here is this is a way of representing in Python, Python code, right? A way of programmatically uh, viewing, inspecting, and manipulating your source. Um, so for instance, really simple, right? X equals one plus two. Uh, we can take this and use the built-in AST module in Python, parse this source code as a string, and what we get back is a tree, basically, uh, that encapsulates all of what's going on there. Uh, and you can see here that we've been returned an, a module object. Um, not obvious at first what that is. Uh, the reason why it's a module object is because the central conceit behind the AST module is that uh, you're meant to be par parsing like source code files, entire files rather, that uh, you're going to then end up using. Um, but we can do other things to inspect this, right? So there's a built-in dump uh, uh, function that will allow us to see what that tree looks like. And you can see here beyond the module, uh, there's a body that has the assignment that we've just made. Uh, we're assigning to this variable x. The value of the assignment is a binary operation uh, where the left-hand side is the number one, the right-hand side is the number two, and the operation we're performing is addition. So hopefully uh, pretty intelligible. A um, Little difficult to read maybe, so there's this awesome tool called ASTOR. Um, primarily uh, its use is in uh, round tripping ASTs, right? So allowing you to go from source code to the AST representation then back to source code, but here I'm using it uh, just to get uh, a slightly terser uh, printout of what the uh, AST is, something that's a little more readable. Um, and beyond that, there's also a tool called Show AST for Jupyter Notebooks. They'll show you a visualization, right? Uh, something graphical that is the same thing as the previous two cells, but just a little easier to inspect sometimes if you want to see what's going on. Um, 
Now, why did I say that uh, AST as abstract syntax tree is a little bit of a misnomer, possibly? I think when um, people hear the word abstract in this, they tend to think, ooh, there's like monads probably, or like oblique references to platonic ideals or something like that. I don't want to do that. I don't want to have to worry about that. It's not like abstract, like super conceptual. It's abstract syntax. So what I mean by that is, again, very simple expression, one plus two plus three. You can see in the AST, it's being represented as one plus two plus three. Uh, but you'll notice this second cell here, we have some brackets around the one plus two, and that isn't represented in the AST. So what's being abstracted away is the syntax, right? We're not able to go from the AST that we get back to the precise original source code uh, because those brackets have been uh, basically stripped from this. And likewise with, uh, there's no representation of like a colon, for instance, in the AST or uh, white space per se, right? You can't tell how many tabs or spaces I use to indent something. Uh, it's a uh, more genericized, I guess, version of the syntax of the source code. Uh, you'll also notice that uh, as I go along here that uh, what the AST doesn't contain is any sort of runtime information which includes types. It does include type annotations, which are part of the syntax, right, but not types themselves. Um, why do you care about the AST just in general, right? Why would you want to look at this? Well, here's a good example of why knowing the AST or looking at the ASTs for different pieces of source code is super useful, right? This is uh, a list comprehension here, right? Item for group and groups for item and group, if check group. This is how I thought list comprehensions had to be written obligatorily, right? That you had, here's what I'm gonna return, here are all my fors, here are all my if conditions. Uh, but if you look at the AST, you'll notice uh, it's a list comprehension, right? Uh, what we're returning is this item expression. Uh, and we have a list of generators. These are comprehensions. And each of these comprehensions has a list of ifs. So what this means is actually I can do this instead, right? I can have the if directly follow a for. Uh, and this is something I didn't know before I looked at what is the representation in the AST of this list comprehension. Uh, and what this does is means that I'm only running that check call for every group and not for every group and every item in the group, right? So you get a little bit more efficiency. You can also have multiple if statements, so you don't have to join them together with and, which can get a little messy syntactically. So there are things you can learn about how Python works uh, just by looking at how the representation of the syntax is. Uh, but this is the real piece de resistance, right? This is where I'm going to take some source code, uh, have it parsed as this parsed variable, and then use the built-in function compile, and what I get back is this code object. What is the code object? Uh, basically, we've taken that source and interpreted it, and now we have some bytecode, right? So this is not, like the AST module is not just something that someone put into Python on a lark. This is deeply embedded into the system, right? This is very, very powerful. Because what we can do with that code object is we can then create an environment, execute the code within that environment, and then pull things out of the environment, right? So like I said, here uh, we have this uh, code that's basically assigning one to X and two to Y, and we can pull out from the environment I passed in X and Y. And of course, if I wanted to, I could have uh, begun by putting things into that environment for that code to access. So again, super, super integrated. One question you might have at this point is, well, uh, if I'm running a program and I want to have access to you know, some of the functions that I'm running, how would I do that? One method is to use the uh, inspect module. So inspect has a git source method uh, defined that will give you back the source for a lot of Python objects, and not all of them, right? So functions and classes, definitely. Um, if you want to access like lambda uh, expressions or if you want to access like generators, it's a little bit more difficult. You have to use uh, what's called a decompiler, uh, which basically will take the bytecode, inspect it, and sort of reverse engineer 
a, uh, an AST out of that. But for most applications, inspect.get source is what you want, right? And again, now that I have the source for the function I've just declared above, I can take that, parse out the AST, do whatever I want to it, uh, and uh, recompile it back into the function if I wanted to. Right, so there are obvious applications for this in static analysis. Um, just to be clear, what is static analysis? Um, well, consider uh, the counterexample of a profiler. So a profiler, uh, you have to be executing the code intrinsically uh, to be profiling it, right? You want to see what runs quickly, what runs slowly, what's calling what. Uh, and that is something you can only do if you actually execute the code. Static analysis is uh, when you're doing an analysis without executing any code, right? So very trivial example would be like counting the lines of code that you have. Um, another example that sort of highlights the distinction here is uh, if you had a program that was checking the syntax of all the code in your code base, right? In that case, you are parsing the code, right? You're getting, you're going to be making it into abstract syntax trees, but you're not executing it, right? You have the difference between the representation of the code and the actual running code itself. Um, so how might we use uh, the AST module to accomplish this? Well, here's a really simple, simple uh, program, I guess, uh, but basically I'm assigned to these three variables, A, B, and C, right? Uh, and if we read this file and we load it in as an AST, you can see here I have my three assignment nodes. Um, shouldn't be anything surprising. Uh, but uh, built into Python, we have this uh, AST.NodeVisitor class that I can subclass. Uh, and basically what this allows you to do is to override methods uh, that all take the format like visit underscore node name. Uh, and when I instantiate this new class and then call dot visit on some AST, it's basically going to traverse that tree, uh, and then every time it reaches an assigned node, in this case, uh, going to call the code that I've given. So in this case, uh, what I'm doing is I'm looking at every target of the assignment, because assignments can have multiple targets, right? You can have x equals y equals one, or something like that. Uh, checking to see whether it's a name node, as opposed to, say, um, assigning to an element of a list, or a key in a dictionary, something like that. And if so, then just printing that out. And you can see here, when I run this, it prints out ABC. Already, there are like serious, legitimate applications for even something this simple, right? Like if anyone's familiar with Alembic, um, it's a migration system for databases, but basically uh, it requires you to declare at module level, I believe, uh, this is what this revision's uh, hash or number is, and this is the previous revision that it's based off of, right? Uh, so you could take something like this, go through all of your migrations, and then create like a graph to ensure that there are no cycles in them or something like that, right? They're already, even with this like very minimal built-in functionality, uh, a lot of things you can do that are interesting. Uh, but further to that, uh, you can do even more cool stuff, right? So this is a tool called AST Search. And if at this point in the talk you're thinking, boy, I wish I hadn't come here, uh, then this is the tool for you. Because basically, AST Search is using the uh, robustness and the power of the AST, uh, but abstracting away for you all the sort of uh, internal complexity of having to learn about ASTs, right? So you can see here, I'm using this as a command line tool. Uh, I'm basically doing AST search uh, and saying question mark equals one. So that's to say some wild card equals one and searching for that sort of pattern uh, in this uh, protobuf repo, right? And what I get back, you can see, uh, I have some things where we're assigning to uh, an attribute of an object. I have some things where I'm just assigned to a name, right? In the AST, in the internal representation, those two things are very different, but uh, AST search allows you to not have to worry about that and just do this sort of very simple pattern matching, which is great. Uh, however, uh, obviously there are a lot more things you can exploit with the AST, so another tool out there is called AST Path. Uh, and this is a little more complex. You have to know, you know what you're doing in terms of uh, what the AST looks like that you're hoping to match on. But basically what this is doing is uh, allows you to supply an XPath expression. Uh, and by doing that, you can capture really interesting um, properties of your code and search for them through your code base, right? So this is something that you can't do with like a regular expression, for instance. I'm looking for numbers where the number's value is greater than 100, right? And because this is the AST, this is going to handle 
integers, it's going to handle floats, it doesn't care whether there are underscores in the number, it doesn't care whether you're, whether you're using scientific notation or not, it's all handled for you. And I want to find those only if they're not assigned to something, right? This is a, a sort of deeper structural property of the code uh, that is difficult to capture if you don't have access to the AST, but with the access to the AST is almost trivial to capture, right? Uh, and you can even do things like not just you know, capturing oh, one line, but here I'm searching for all function definitions that have at least one decorator and have a for loop in the body, right? So I can capture really, really deep structural properties of my code that are very, very difficult, if not impossible, to capture in any other way. Um, so, uh, PEP572, rest in peace, Guido. Uh, people aren't aware of this. Basically, uh, what it allows you to do is, opposed to saying match equals pattern.search data and then use match in this if statement later on, you can use this assignment expression syntax to uh, basically assign to match within uh, your if statement. There are a bunch of other use cases, but this is sort of um, the primary one that's touted. Uh, obviously, I don't have a very strong opinion on this, uh, mostly because I have a strong interest later on in not being thrown to the back of a car. Uh, but uh, if you want to see, well, where can I apply this in my code base, you can use AST path. You can say, all right, I want to find all assignments uh, where the name is the same as the very following statements, uh, if it's an if statement, uh, being used in the test for that if statement, right? So a few of these lines, uh, because it's not respecting uh, white space or anything like that, a few of them, the second line is blank, but you can see here, for instance, uh, here we have uh, this callable, callable being assigned to, and then if callable is none, that's a candidate for replacement with the new uh, assignment uh, expressions. Um, now I know some of you are thinking, ooh, I'm gonna go back I'm going to use that AST path tool, uh, and I'm going to start creating this sort of programmatic uh, way of capturing things that I don't like in uh, my code base. You know, the sort of things where you have PR after PR after PR of just commenting the same thing over and over and over again, and you just want to have some sort of tool that you can run that catches all of those things that you don't like. Don't worry, fam, I got you covered. Let's say that this is uh, my code base, pretty small. Uh, the uh, function that I'm interested in here is this call to deprecated function. I have just written in my PR a super sexy new function that's going to replace this. Uh, but it's a, it turns out there's like 3,000 uses of deprecated function. I don't really want to do that all my PR. And some of them are oh, a little difficult to to undo and like, let's just leave that for someone else, right? So uh, I can use this tool called belly button, right? And this is basically a wrapper around AST path, um, but I can define different rules. Uh, so in this case, a deprecated function call rule. I give it a description that's going to be basically the error message if this is caught in my code base. Um, I give it the expression, which is basically this XPath expression that I want to run against the ASTs of all the uh, modules in my code base. Uh, and I can give an example of what this looks like, what not to do, and uh, something to do instead, both of which are validated against that expression. So when you run this tool, you can be sure that uh, the example and counter example you've given uh, actually adhere to what you're looking for. Uh, and then also some stuff about like where do I want to run this, which is not super important. Um, but basically, I can then take this and run this on my code base. And as you can see here, it gives me back, oh, this linting has failed because I'm using this deprecated function in this particular uh, code.py. Uh, and obviously, this is sort of just the tip of the iceberg, right? This is a pretty superficial thing to look for. But you could also do things like, let's say I have an enum with a bunch of different values, uh, and I want to make sure that if I'm sort of working with one of those values that all of the other cases are handled, right? I could write an expression that says, if I have an if statement where I'm checking against one of the values, then I am obliged to also have else ifs for every one of the other values. This is something you could implement relatively easy with an AST path expression. And then all of a sudden, you're getting some of those really cool compile time almost guarantees that uh, super functional languages like Haskell and Scala will give you, but 
specific to your project uh, in Python. Um, just a little brief interlude. So these are some of the tools I've talked about so far. Um, two that I didn't mention, but which are very cool. You should look at them. Uh, one is called uh, Green Tree Snakes. So basically, this is like pitched as the, uh, the missing guide to the Python AST, um, but it is a riveting read, and I highly recommend it. Uh, the other one is Python AST Explorer. Basically, what this tool lets you do is it's an online tool. You paste in some code on the left-hand side of this uh, page, and on the right-hand side, it gives you like this collapsible view uh, as a, of the tree that basically the code will be represented as in the AST. Again, super, super useful, especially if you're going to go and write like AST path expressions, for instance. Um, the, uh, the thing is, because this is on GitHub, you can just go take a look through these, maybe give them a few stars, I don't know. Uh, I know that it's a little bit of a vanity metric, but do consider that uh, in our post-apocalyptic, post-singularity future, uh, aka Q1 2019, uh, Git stars will be used to determine whether or not you have to work in the silicon mines, so give generously. <laughs> right, so now we're gonna be shifting a little bit. Before, we are just looking at what's the structure here? Can we query on this structure? Now we're gonna be looking at can we take the underlying AST, do some manipulation on it, make some changes to it, and then uh, run that code. So this is where a lot of people get very uncomfortable, and there's a good reason why. So uh, there are basically two um, forms of AST manipulation. Uh, I'll call them static and dynamic. Uh, static AST manipulation is basically, so you have um, some code base, right? You have a program that's gonna run on that code base, uh, and that program reads each of the files, does some manipulation to it, uh, and then writes it back out to source, right? What's the problem with this? Uh, well, from a development standpoint, it's a little weird, right? Because if I have this like pre-processed and then post-processed code, am I meant to be working with the post-processed code? Is that my check into my version control? Uh, if not, then I guess I have to build that during like my build and deploy process, but then how do I find out what the code ended up looking like at the end? Like it's a, it's a mess. Uh, dynamic uh, AST manipulation is no less of a mess, but basically the, the premise here is that as opposed to doing that uh, once in sort of this processing process, uh, you're going to be doing it with code that you have access to in whatever scope you're in, right? So sort of live code objects that you're going to be manipulating, which obviously has a similar problem in that uh, how do you know what you got out? And like, if there's an exception that ends up being raised and you look at the trace back, you're gonna be pointing to a line that doesn't match up to anything in your code base. So again, a little bit difficult to debug. Um, so with that being said, how many people's initial reaction is, oh man, get that as far away from my code base as possible? Can I get a show of hands? All right, a few, a few. Uh, now, how many people use PyTest? Hmm. I think I see some people that raise their hand twice. Uh, well, let me tell you something. Uh, PyTest, what a great tool, right? Mm, so simple. I just wrote this little test. It's like super easy. I don't have to like create a class and use self.assert not is false or whatever in unit test. Uh, and hey, when I run it, Look at this uh, error message I get, right? It says, hey, you know, this failed, but not only did it fail, like I tried rerunning it and there's some weird stateful stuff going on and like you should really look into this. Or maybe I had a different test, right? Maybe I had a test where at the end of it I was like saying, oh, assert this dictionary equals this dictionary. Oh, and look, PyTest gives me back this like super, super, super nice diff of saying, oh, these keys don't match these keys and it's just so easy to use. How's it do it? Well, it takes uh, the code that I have there in uh, cell 32 and transforms it into that monstrosity, which no one wants to write or read. Uh, and this is not meant to be like a bait and switch. Like this is a really good application for AST manipulation. The sort of tooling that you are going to run as a developer locally uh, is a fantastic candidate, right? Because you may want to do manipulations like this that make your life a whole lot easier, but you wouldn't necessarily be comfortable doing in like a super critical production system. Uh, how many people here are familiar with uh, protobuf? It's not super critical that you are, but a lot of hands, that's great. So um, essentially what it is is a, a schema language uh, for uh, 
serializing messages, right? So very simple schema I have here. Uh, I have like a latitude, a longitude, and a message. And this is like something I want to log out to some system, right? Um, what's the problem with protobuf? Well, it's super strongly typed, and uh, Python is pretty dynamic. So let's say this is my function that I'm going to write to uh, create this protobuf message. I have my lat, I have my long, I create the message, I'm starting to populate these attributes. Maybe I have to do some conversions or something. Maybe I want to format the message. Uh, and then I want to return the, uh, return the protobuf file. Um, looks good. But what happens when I put in uh, a float instead of an int? Uh, protobuf goes berserk when you try to assign to that particular attribute. And this is a problem, right? Because uh, the last thing you want is for your logging system that's meant to log your errors, also creating errors that then don't get logged. That's a, that's a poor outcome. So um, the other, you know, this is not just, I mean, this is sort of a trivial example because you'd say, oh, well, you could use MyPy and you could just make sure that everything's an int and yada, 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 but how do you know your int is within the int32 range? It's a little more difficult, a little more onerous. What you really want that function to look like, the function that constructs the protobuf message, is more like this second cell, right, where you're creating it, uh, and then you don't want, like, if there's something going wrong in the conversion, you don't want that to be caught, so you want to assign that to, like, this temporary variable, and then, oh, uh, you want to assign to the attribute, and you want to catch a type error, I guess, and maybe you want to, like, print out a warning or something, and then you have to do that for every one of these, and then you return it, and it's like, oh, man, this is, like, not clear to me as some other developer who has to go into this code and figure out what's going on. So how might we solve this? Well, uh, the AST module also has a built-in node transformer class, which can subclass very similar to the uh, node visitor class. Uh, and this is a pretty long bit of code here, but uh, just to make it clear, basically here I'm checking, are we assigning to uh, an attribute of this protobuf message? Here is what I'm going to be replacing that assignment with, right? So I'm saying basically the same thing I just had in the previous slide. I have to assign to a temporary variable, and then I have this try except, which is going to take that uh, temporary variable and assign it to the protobuf uh, attribute. Uh, and then finally here, this is the only part that's a little um, strange. Basically, the uh, uh, visit assign method is uh, expected to return a single node, but we want to replace the previous single assign node we had with multiple nodes. So we wrap them all in a uh, if statement that always is uh, going to run. And what do we get out of this? Uh, well, if here's our original function, uh, we can do the same stuff that I've shown you already, right? Get the source of it, parse that into an AST, uh, and then uh, call uh, the assign replacer dot visit method on this, then transform that back into our source code. Of course, we could also compile it if we wanted to in some environment, uh, and we get back essentially what we wanted. And I think it's an open question uh, whether this is more or less maintainable uh, than just writing uh, this, the code that's output, right? Because the code that's output is really oblique and opaque and not a great experience, whereas the other one is pretty terse. Um, one thing you should note is that, is this testable? Yeah, totally, as testable as any decorator, right? You could, in fact, wrap this up in a decorator. You don't have to have this at the bottom of your module or something. Um, it's just another thing where you need to pass in a bunch of functions, make sure that the functions you get back from it uh, are uh, performing what you expect them to. It's, it's something that you can use in code. Um, the, uh, the other thing about that previous uh, AST transformer that I showed you is quite verbose. You might say, well, you have to know a lot about the AST to figure out what's going on there, uh, or to write it, in fact. Uh, here's another tool called AST Tools, fantastic library. Uh, you can use this quoted template decorator, and basically this gives you a function where I can pass in the protobuf attribute I'm going to assign to as an AST node, and the value I'm going to assign to as an AST node, uh, and specify what I want to get back. And when I run this, I'll get uh, basically an AST, uh, a list of AST nodes that'll have this assignment, this uh, try accept, uh, yada, yada, yada. So it makes it a lot cleaner, a lot easier to follow. Uh, DSLs, everyone loves a good DSL, right? We are infatuated with them in programming. We love SQL, we love regular expressions. What's the problem with DSLs? 
We represent them as strings in our code. What does that mean? Well, supposing, for instance, that uh, this is the space of all strings, um, the space of all regular expressions might look like this, right? There are just so, so many strings that aren't valid regular expressions. What's the practical impact of that? The practical impact is you're not actually leveraging this tool you have, the, the Python syntax checker, basically, uh, to make sure these are valid. So you have no guarantees about whether your regular expression, when it gets run, is going to compile or not, right? Uh, another example, strings, right? XPath. Strings, boom, 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 boom. SQL, boop. Not a great situation, right? There's a little bit of a mismatch here. And what's the practical effect of this? I'll tell you what the practical effect of this is. The practical effect is that Sam, who sits next to you, just checked this into the code base, and some branch is never going to run until you go on holiday, and then it's exclusively going to run, and you find out that Postgres actually doesn't understand Shakespearean English at all. But on a serious note, I once had a project I was working on where uh, it had a lot of XPath expressions, and uh, I ran a little tool on them that I made to uh, see what was going on, and about 20% of them were invalid syntactically. So this is not just like made up like academic problem. This is something that real people have wet themselves to sleep over. So this is a serious issue. Um, ah but here's a solution. What a fantastic use of AST manipulation. A little tool called Pony ORM. What this does is it lets you use generator syntax to create SQL queries. How does it do that? Well, you have this very simple expression, customer for customer and customers. Uh, if some customer.org is a total price is greater than or equal to, or sorry, greater than 1,000. Um, what does it? It takes that generator, it uh, decompiles it to get the bytecode, uh, sorry, to get the AST, then does the manipulation from the AST into uh, SQL, basically. Uh, and what's the nice thing about this? Well, okay, maybe it doesn't give you the full expressive capacity of SQL, but what it does give you is a guarantee that Python, when you import this module or whatever, is going to throw up and say, oops, syntax error, and you're going to know that from the start, right? If you have syntactically valid uh, generator expressions, you know that you can get syntactically valid SQL. It's a guarantee. And likewise, uh, you uh, can make sure that if you want to later on, you have a programmatic way of manipulating this using the AST module, as opposed to having to do like weird string manipulation. Uh, there's also a tool called XPyth that will do this for XPath expressions. I don't know of one for regular expressions, but I'm sure one is forthcoming. Testing, right? Um, this is a, kind of a broad topic, but you ever notice in testing, like, all right, I, I wrote my cool, like, uh, quick sort implementation. I don't know why I wrote it, but I got a check mark on my PR, so that's all cool. I'm using uh, modern CI practices, so of course I had some tests in there, and I made sure those tests passed, and everything's copacetic, and I'm about to merge this into master. Since my tests all pass before I merge into master, why do I have the tests still? I mean, obviously, maybe when I was writing this, I wanted to have them to make sure that my code ran properly, but now I know it runs properly, why don't I just delete those? Well, it's not really that you care about whether your code that you have runs properly, right? It's actually more that you want to capture, if someone else comes along and manipulates this and makes some changes, that this still works, right? So it's not that you care about whether your code now works, you care about whether if your code were wrong, that this test would fail, right? And that's how you know whether it's a good test or not, if the test would fail if your code were wrong. Is that hard to capture? No, because we can use the AST, right? We can use this cool tool called Cosmic Ray. We can have it automatically make a bunch of random permutations to the code that are almost certainly gonna make it fail. Uh, and then at that point, we can validate our test suite against that and see how often are we actually capturing those failures versus how often are we actually writing tests that don't do anything, just happen to run the code and give us like a nice code coverage metric, uh, but aren't making sure our behavior's enforced that we want. So again, super great use 
on like the dev side, not on the like production side of a tool that you can use to uh, do something you would have a lot of difficulty doing uh, with some other, you know, if you're just trying to manipulate this as a string, right? And this will do things like, oh, I'm gonna switch these branches around, I'm gonna invert these conditions, all sorts of good stuff. And again, here are some of the things that I've uh, just been talking about. If you wanna go back at some later point and uh, check these out, that'd be awesome. Okay, so um, what's next for AST manipulation? What do I see as being the problems? Uh, well, number one, uh, source mapping. If you're familiar with front-end development, you might know this term, um, but the essential conceit here is like I have some JavaScript and I want to minify that JavaScript or I have some TypeScript that I want to compile into JavaScript, uh, but when I run that, uh, minified version, I want to then be able to actually debug or see what's going up, uh, going wrong with the original code that I had, right? The same sort of traceback issue that I talked about before. The, uh, the JavaScript community has solved this problem, right? We should just steal this. This is a serious hindrance to uh, us using AST manipulation in production. Like I just said, neither dynamic or static AST manipulation uh, has a good answer for this. So we should have a, a tool that lets us do this, right? Also, AST manipulation in general needs to be easier, right? Um, the AST uh, transformer, sorry, no transformer that I showed you earlier was pretty verbose, required you to know a lot about uh, what's going on, uh, on underlyingly, right? Um, not something that most people are really willing to dive into. We need something that's like the AST equivalent of find and replace that is super simple to use and produces good results. And then finally, um, this is a, sort of a consideration, but um, backwards compatibility has not been great, right? If you think about the minor releases of Python that have been going on, there's a lot of new syntax added. Some of it's really awesome. Some of it you wouldn't want to live without. But uh, the problem is that although to most people that's like a totally uh, unnoticeable backwards compatible change, on the AST level there can be very, very significant changes. And a lot of the tools I want to show during this presentation I found out weren't compatible with 3.6, right? Which is a shame. Uh, we're losing out on a lot of uh, what we could have, uh, a lot of the tooling we could have by not having some like intermediary form, right, uh, that's a backwards compatible AST that will work uh, over different versions of Python, for instance, or even just by considering more carefully uh, what changes to the AST will end up resulting in for different AST-based tools. So another area that moving forward, I think that we could really benefit from looking at. So. Let's talk about what you learned in this uh, presentation. First of all, ASTs, easy, useful, tons of tools out there, right? Now you can go take this presentation, get started with stuff, start reading a little bit more about it, start using these in your own code bases, right? Uh, but more importantly, you also learned that I am a visionary, the likes of which an Elon Musk figure sort of would uh, <laughs> like to aspire to become one day. Um, and yes, those posters are available online. Just uh, send me an email. So, here are my closing thoughts. Alan Turing once said, there need, be, <laughs> there need be no real danger of programming ever becoming a drudge, for any processes that are quite mechanical may be turned over to the machine itself. A beautiful thought, right? A thought that was expressed almost 80 years ago. And every time I find myself writing a bunch of boilerplate code I cry a little inside because this is not where we're at right now. If this is still a place we want to get to, and I think it is, then we are going to need to have code that understands code. And ASTs are the best way of doing that. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chase, for this insightful talk. Hands up, who got some inspiration to clean up his own code base now? Quite a few people. Questions? Uh, so you did mention that AST manipulation can still be quite tricky, and it's backwards incompatible and things like that. Do you think that uh, Python would benefit from uh, having uh, macro syntax of some sort and uh, exposing that um, more to the developer? Um, you know, uh, I really enjoy Python being a pretty minimalist language, although it's getting to be less so maybe. Um, 
I don't think that that is necessary to be built in. I think that we already have a lot of the tools that you need to do that if you wish to, and then if you don't want to get your hands onto any of this sort of stuff, then it's not something you have to worry about, right? So uh, I like not having that capability in Python just to keep things simpler for people who don't want to mess with it. Do you think we should go full JavaScript and have extra layers on top of Python then? <laughs> Maybe. I mean, so <laughs> I think the thing that you might hopefully will take away from this is like, um, let's say there's a pep you really liked uh, that didn't go through, like a pattern matching or something, right? Or something you really need that's specific to your project but isn't universally applicable, right? Uh, you can do that through AST manipulation. So it could be argued that maybe for some domains, you have that extra layer that goes from something that's more appropriate to what you're doing to Python. Not a bad idea, I think. So what problems at your company did you actually solve with? those IS, <laughs> ISD tools? Ooh, uh, well, uh, I'm about to be crucified here, but uh, not at my current company, but in a previous company, I was uh, stuck with a Python 2.7 code base, which I know no one here has ever had to dirty themselves with uh, working with. However, um, I needed to have yield from syntax, which isn't in Python 2.7. Uh, and, uh, Helpfully, the pep says, hey, do you know that yield from is equivalent to this block of Python code? So uh, basically, <laughs> um, more generally though, uh, I've used uh, AST querying and search more to uh, do like custom linting stuff, which I found very, very, very helpful um, because, you know, PyLint, for instance, right, has some good general rules, but not ones that are going to be specific to your project. Um, and then just on top of that, being able to do introspection to see like, oh, what's going on in this? Uh, I wrote something once that uh, went through, like I said, a, a code base to see what are all the XPath expressions in this, which was based off how was the string being used in terms of what method was calling it, things like that. So it's nifty to be able to pull out uh, for those sorts of things. Okay, thanks. Uh, hi. Uh, do you have any experience with uh, using uh, full syntax tree tools like Red Baron or similar? So I haven't personally, but uh, I know other people who have. Uh, and that's, uh, yeah, definitely if you want to do the sort of static manipulation, um, full syntax tree tools will uh, preserve sort of that white space, the colons, all that good stuff, so that the code that you get out will be uh, closer uh, to what you originally put in. So I think definitely if you're going to be looking into doing uh, uh, static AST manipulation, that's the way to go. Hi. Um, there's CTX on load in one of the first examples. Mm -hmm. Where you do an AST dump, what does that mean? Uh, so um, yeah, I don't actually know whether the Python interpreter cares about that, but basically it's giving you some context about uh, for a specific name node. Um, there are a few different things they can be. The major ones are store and load, which represent whether you're loading that value uh, from the environment or from the scope, or whether you're storing that into the scope, if that makes sense. One final question. I see you made a reference to SQL Alchemy, and then later on you put a slide with pony.orm, and then you suggested that pony.orm can generate uh, SQL statements. Are you suggesting that uh, SQL Alchemy does not do it in the same fashion? Uh, SQL Alchemy doesn't, as far as I know, maybe I'm wrong, doesn't give you the uh, ability to transform generators into uh, SQL. It, maybe I'm incorrect on that front. I haven't really kept up with SQL Alchemy specifically, um, but. If it does, that's awesome. Uh, and if not, I think Pony is a great tool for you. Be, being able to go into a code base, not necessarily even knowing SQL, but just use the Python that you know to be able to really uh, guarantee that you're going to have valid SQL expressions. OK, so the next thing will be the lunch break. If you want, we can continue the question and answer session for a couple of minutes. There's still, I think, two questions.
you put the source mapping thing about in the next. So it means there is nothing now or there is some preliminary project or, because that's the part I'm interested in. I mean, if I get an error the line number, how to map that line number to my original code? No, that's totally. I mean, I, I definitely think that it's a place where as far as I know, the ecosystem is deficient, right? A lot of these things, uh, most people wouldn't feel comfortable doing outside of like experimentation without being able to tell where is this error coming from. And as far as I know, uh, there aren't any solutions for that in Python right now. Okay. Uh, PyTest doesn't go both ways, right? So PyTest will just produce for you the uh, new code, and I think basically what they've done is test the code that they generate well enough so you'd never have internal errors happening in that. Uh, and I think it just keeps track of what line it replaced to show you the error on that line. Yeah. Uh, great talk. Thank you. Um, so there's a Haskell monad bind operator, uh, which is represented by two arrows to the right and an equals. Yep. Uh, can we support this in Python using the AST? Yeah. I mean, you could, so uh, it depends on what you mean by support, it's right? It's not valid Python. It's, but... uh, oh, sorry, sorry, I, I understand your question. So that specific syntax, no, right? So if you're using the, at least if you're using the uh, AST module, you're beholden to actually writing syntactically valid Python code, right? You could do something if you want to, like um, Scala has four comprehensions, uh, which will basically do that sort of monadic binding. You could have a similar thing in Python, right, where you could say, I'm going to take this generator uh, comprehension, run that, get the AST, uh, and uh, transform that into a series of um, flat maps and maps uh, if you wanted to. But you can't support syntax that doesn't already exist in Python. Thanks. So let's thank Chase again for this insightful talk. <laughs> <laughs>